Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are joining me from. I am so pleased that you are. My name is Barton Seaver. I am a chef, author, husband, father, proud resident of the Jagged Ragged, delicious coast of Maine, where from I am joining you today. I know that a lot of you join us from all over the world, so uh, this is always a really fun thing for me to do. Um, we've got a little bit different program uh, than what we had scheduled, unfortunately, our very dear friend Nadine Brown, uh, who is not feeling up to uh, the event today, and we wish her all the very best. She is uh, doing well, but uh, that is not in the cards for us today. So those of you who signed on to see our event with Nadine, uh, talking about all things wine, just amongst great friends, I'm sorry that that won't be today, but we will be in touch with you to let you know when Nadine will be joining us again. I know that she was eager to talk to all of you. So uh, today's topic, we kind of threw together, well, and then throw it together because, well, it's it's what I do every day, all day, because I love it. It's seafood and vegetables. So we're doing uh, a bunch of different dishes today, um, and uh, vegetable-forward seafood dishes. And we'll get into those uh, in a second, but uh, just to start you off, if you look at the right-hand side of your screen there, there's a column of questions. Please, please drop in your question. It doesn't have to be on any single topic, seafood or vegetables, whatever it is. You want to talk about unicorns? Let's do it. Dungeons and Dragons? I don't know anything, but hey, let's do it, right? You want to talk politics? Mm, probably not the best place for it, but hey, let's do it. Any question you want, throw it in the right-hand column over there. Questions that you already see, you can click the little heart button to vote them up to the top to make sure we get to them. I'm going to be presenting for maybe 20 minutes or so on a bunch of different dishes. Those dishes are, uh, we have recipes for you, which are included. Uh, if you look just under the screen where I am, you'll see event document link right over there. It's a little uh, PDF file of the recipes that we're going to be talking about today. So download that, cooking for your friends, cooking for your family, whatever you'd like to do. But uh, those of you who've ever joined me before know that I like to start off with, uh, well, a little bit of gratitude because well, that is what cooking is, isn't it? Cooking is an act of love. It is an act of kindness. And the world needs a, a lot more of that right now. So I want to thank you personally, for all that you are doing to feed people in your life, in your circle, uh, because you are caring for them. And part of that is this act of gratitude for their presence. And, well, things that I am grateful for, well, uh, maple syrup. Look at that. Yeah. So I have been uh, blessed with an incredible two maple trees out front on our property. They're probably about 85, 100 years old. I have been doing battle with them over a, uh, a large wood fire out back on the farm here. And, uh, well, we've had not one, but two, not two, but three and four, and not just four, but five rounds of boiling for the syrup. And I've got over uh, three, almost three and a half gallons of maple syrup by this point. And really kind of fun to look at the difference between them as the sap grows from the very beginning of the season. I messed this one up. I crystallized the sugar in it. So I've got maple candy growing up the side of my glass jar here, which is delicious as long as you can avoid the glass. So yeah, but it's delicious enough that despite I'm actually going to try and eat it. Anyway, I'm really grateful for maple syrup. Another thing I'm really grateful for is, well, spring. Maple syrup being uh, sort of the first culinary uh, emergence of spring here in Maine in these cold climes as well. We have smelts, these delicious little fish returning up the rivers. But for the first time, just this morning, I saw my little garlic peeking up through the ground out there. Still somewhat frozen, but the garlic is peeking up and... Well, isn't that wonderful? Yep. So, and the third thing that I'm going to say I'm grateful for, because I haven't seen y'all in a couple of days, a couple of weeks now, uh, is that my wife and I were getting a new roof put on our house. And in this pandemic, well, I think a lot of us have gone back and thought about and reconsidered what we think success is, what we think thriving is in this world. And thriving is a meal on our plate, the promise of the next meal being secure and having a roof over our heads. So the fact that uh, I'm able to sit here and talk to you about meals, about food that 
I'm secure and is coming and having a new roof over our head uh, is that is thriving, right? That is as best we can do in the world. But I will say spending money on a new roof is about as unsexy of a thing as, as can be. We spent a lot of money to get what I already had, right? It's kind of, you yeah. know, anyway, I'm thrilled to have it and honored and blessed. So with that, throw in some questions for you over there on the right hand side of the column. Um, and we're going to talk into seafood for uh, bench forward seafood dishes. All right, diving in. So I've got a couple of dishes th today, three of them for you that I'm going to talk through. The first is a caponata. Caponata is a, a sweet sour preparation, uh, very common in southern Italian cuisine. Uh, I've known it through travels in Sicily and books uh, on the topic there. Um, but what's so great about it is that it's seasonal. You can do it. I've done autumn versions of it that include turnips and butternut squash and walnuts and late season tomatoes, etc. Uh, the version that I've cooked up and the recipe that I have for you today has broccoli and eggplant, uh, yellow squash. So a lot of these seafood or these veg forward seafood dishes, why I think seafood works so well in them is and, and why it's different than meat per se is that seafood cooks so quickly. It cooks so delicately, gently. You don't have to do these long simmered braises as you do with, say, pork or beef in a beef stew, you know, which is about the only preparation of beef that I can think of, you know, maybe other than a pot roast, which is really veg inclusive, right? But it's still not veg centric. Um, seafood allows us to do that because a lot of vegetable preparations, they're fresh, they're bright, they're light, they're clean. You don't need hours of cooking time at high heats, right? Well, such is the same for seafood. So these dishes are really the vegetable dish as the primary inspiration and driver of it. And then really at the very end of all of them, you'll see that the pattern is I just kind of take a piece of frozen fish directly from the freezer and nestle it in there, simmer it for another seven, 10 minutes, turn it off and just let it rest. And there you go. But really what's selling the dish, really what you take your time cooking is the vegetables. So we have that caponata. I'm also gonna do a succotash, uh, a version of that, which is sort of a mashup of creamed corn as well as succotash, the classic combination of bean, squash and corn. Uh, and then also doing a puttanesca style uh, which is another Italian style, which is garnished with olives and capers and deeply flavored, etc. Sorry, I'm hearing a whole lot of noise because, well, it's my live segment, and what better time for the cat to wake up for the only hour of the day that she's awake to come bother me? I wouldn't say bother me. I love her very dearly. I love her presence. All right, so caponata. Here's the recipes that I was cooking off of and cooked for you. Just updated them downloading the event document. So, caponata, got it right over here. So in this dish, and it's very hard to kind of show you, but what you've got here is eggplant, you've got squash, red, uh, yellow pepper, you've got fresh tomatoes, capers, almonds, raisins, and I threw some broccoli in there because, why not broccoli? Because my four-year-old boy loves broccoli. He asks for it all the time. So. Throw some broccoli in there. I've actually never cooked broccoli into a caponata before, but sweet sour broccoli doesn't doesn't that sound good, right? Yeah. So why not? So this is the final dish, and forgive the presentation here as the liquid is running. But what I did is I started off with the um, onion and pepper, sautéing it in really quite a lot of olive oil, uh, about six tablespoons or so. Uh, and you simmered this down. The, the, the key to a vegetable forward seafood sort of braised dish like this is really developing those deep layers of flavor, uh, simmering them all together, and then just barely finishing the fish, almost cooking it as though it is cooking in the sauce. So any, some of you might have joined me for my braised seafood dish uh, class uh, a few months back. And so a lot of this is very similar to that. So what I've done here is start off with a good deal of olive oil, sauteed your onion and your pepper just to soften it down because I think that the flavor of those, uh, the alliums, the peppers are better when sauteed rather than simmered um, as would happen later if you just added them later uh, once more moisture has been introduced. 
So the onion and pepper saute three to five minutes just until you've wilted them down and sort of softened that flavor. And then I add in a can of anchovies with their oil. Uh, and it doesn't make the dish taste like anchovies. It makes the, everything else in the dish taste better than it thought it could. Anchovies are really this umami rich pedestal upon which other flavors are augmented. Uh, so slivered almonds as well as some raisins. And I sort of toast all of that in the olive oil as well. Uh, the anchovies mash down, they disintegrate into the dish. Uh, and then I add, uh, I add a yellow squash and eggplant and broccoli and uh, just toss that all together. Let's see, what else did I then add in? Uh, a couple of fresh tomatoes, so not canned. You could certainly use that. And then I had maple syrup boiling away the very last stage of reduction, which happens here uh, in the house on the stove. So I just used a couple of spoonfuls of maple syrup directly over. You could also use molasses. I then also used some red wine vinegar that I've got, uh, some lemon juice, some salt, uh, and just a little bit of water. And the recipe that I've, I've given you calls for about a half cup of water, but really the water, you add in only as much as you need. And this all depends on the vegetables that you're using. Uh, was your zucchini or your eggplant just picked an hour ago from the farm? Well, not in March, no. But uh, you know, later on, of course, it's going to have more moisture in it. So this is really playing it by ear. What you want is this integrated dish that's not too runny, but it does have enough moisture to kind of stew itself. Uh, and I simmered it with the, with the top off for about half an hour or so. Is that a long time to cook vegetables? Yes, it is. But, uh, you know, we did an event with Domenica Marchetti, our first Around the Table series that we were supposed to be doing, the second one of today with Nadine, uh, the incredible Italian cook she is. And she gave us the great advice of don't be afraid to cook your vegetables for a long period of time. You know, we in sort of the French uh, culinary canon think about cooking vegetables just this very quick blanch, you know, cook them as little as possible, shock them, keep them bright, light, al dente, crisp, which is wonderful and great. But there's also something to be said for just cooking them down. Let that broccoli go. Let it simmer. Let it develop all of these flavors. And you'd be amazed at how sweet broccoli is. Or green beans or Romano beans simmered long and slow in tomato sauce. And basically, that's what we've done. So the vegetables aren't falling apart. They're still very much identifiable, and they still have structural integrity. So they're not just, you know, when you pick it up with a fork or a spoon, you have on your fork or your spoon what you intended to have on your fork and your spoon. Um, but it is now integrated fully. And then for about 10 minutes after that, I lowered the heat down to, to low, as it's been the whole time, and then nestled in Pacific rockfish fillets. Uh, these are Alaskan rockfish. These have a, a meaty texture. It's somewhat like red snapper, if you will, in terms of that flake and the, the sort of toothsomeness, the bite of it. Uh, but it's a very mild flavored fish. It's white, just slightly off-white. But really, any kind of fish would work in this. I mean, if you think of all the flavors that are in there, right? I, I mean, hey, what wouldn't taste good in this? My, my left hand would taste good in this. Uh, you know? It would. So really, you're creating that, that beautiful, delicious, unctuous, braised vegetable base. I threw in the fish from frozen, just straight out of the freezer. Uh, you could use salmon, Alaska pollock. You can use cod, fresh fish, frozen fish, whatever it is. Nestle it in so that it's submerged in the vegetables. And I cooked the frozen fish for about seven minutes. And then I just turned the heat off and left it sit. And that continuation heat will take care of defrosting and then gently cooking that fish. This is a dish that I, all of these dishes are ones that I would recommend cooking at least a couple hours ahead of time, if not preferably a day ahead of time. Let it cool down on the stovetop, put it in the fridge overnight, take it out, very gently rewarm it over low heat. Take your time. It takes all the stress out of something and there you go. And it gets better like all stewed or braised dishes they're better the second day. Um, even better later on, just all those flavors get to marry. So that's the caponata. And again, the flavor there is sort of the sweet, sour balance, uh, the sweetness and sourness of the vegetables, the vinegar, the maple syrup, 
And uh, though the recipe does give exact quantities, really it's up to taste. Uh, you don't want it to be overly sweet. You don't want it to be overly acidic. Um, nor should either of those components really be the principal thing or the principal things that you taste. Rather, they are the background of the dish that makes everything else just hum together. All right. So the second dish uh, is a fun one. This is a succotash. So I had mentioned that uh, succotash is traditionally a, uh, a mashup of corn, beans, and squash. Uh, and the reason for this, this is actually an old Narragansett um, Indian uh, sort of dish, trifecta, uh, that was typical of their farming practices. The, the three sisters, squash, beans, and corn, because they all use different nutrients that each other provide for them. So it's this wonderful little trifecta of, of symbiosis. Uh, and succotash is actually from the Narragansett Indian word of Sikwatash, I believe it's called, um, pronounced. So anyway, just a fun thing. But what I've done is sort of a, um, as I mentioned at the outset, a, a mashup of creamed corn with uh, just straight corn vegetables. And this is a late winter dish, folks, because, uh, well, all of this basically came out of the freezer with the exception of the corn, which I was able to find uh, fresh. But this is all year round stuff. Um, can of can, can of kidney beans, some frozen edamame, uh, soybeans, uh, shelled, an onion, a yellow squash, or you could use zucchini and the corn. And I've cooked some sockeye salmon into that, but again, almost any other any fish would work, fresh or frozen. I did the same thing. I cooked the vegetables and then nestled in the frozen fish. So the technique on this is I used a little bit of butter because, well, corn and Butter, oh, hi. you make me happy. Corn and butter, they make me happy. That's a perfect combination, right? So just a couple tablespoons of butter. You can use olive oil or any other oil, or you could do this plant-based and just do it uh, dry, dry saute to soften the onions and the corn together. Uh, but the creamed corn aspect of this comes not from cream, but rather from taking some of the fresh corn uh, as well as the corn cobs that I scraped down, uh, and pureeing that with water. You ever thicken something with cornstarch in your cooking, right? Well, where does cornstarch come from? Corn. Hey, imagine that. Cool, right? So there's cornstarch in fresh corn, and it just has to be released or sort of made accessible. So one thing is after cutting the kernels off the corn, take a knife, the back of a knife, and then scrape down into a bowl, scrape down the cobs. And what you'll end up getting is you're sort of milking the corn, it's called, uh, and you get this puree of absolutely delicious corn juice that's also very much rich in the accessible cornstarch that you're looking for. So scraping down those cobs is really, well, you're maximizing your, your value on the corn, uh, as well as maximizing the flavor. Those cobs can be used, uh, of course, in stock afterwards, making vegetable stock or whatever you'd like to do, uh, adding them to chicken stock, whatever. Uh, but pureeing some of the corn kernels, about a third of them or so, with some water creates this fresh corn slurry. And you want to use a very high-speed blender for this or a stick blender, something that's really going to break up the corn. Uh, and that's mostly... A, to make it accessible, but also to reduce any negative textural impact of having just small, tiny bits of corn. You really want them pureed fully. Um, and so you simmer down your onions and your corn, then you add your squash, your cannellini, uh, your uh, kidney beans. You can use any kind of bean you want to. Um, and if you're using a white bean, a cannellini bean, a chickpea, etc., uh, instead of draining off those and pouring the water out or using it for a different purpose, puree your corn with the agua fava uh, or the liquid that comes out of the can or you know, from fresh cooking them, whatever you'd like. The kidney bean liquid is too dark and it really adds a, a sort of an unappetizing color to the whole dish and what you want is that, that freshness there. So 
you could puree your corn with that liquid or as I did here, just with water. Add in all your ingredients and then add in your corn puree, bring it to a boil, and what you'll see is, well, the, the whole thing starts to look a lot like creamed corn, right? Because it's corn cream, corn, corn creamed, creamed corn. There you go, right? So there's a, you know, make this without oil or make it with a with olive oil, take out the butter, and you've got vegan creamed corn, but you've also got the full nutritional profile of the soybeans, the kidney beans, the corn, and the yellow squash in there. You could use butternut squash if you want to mash up seasons. And this is a really fun dish. So at the end of that, again, just like with the uh, Pacific Rockfish, I took sockeye salmon and just nestled it in there, simmered it another seven minutes, top on, and just let it sit. And there's your dish, and that's a beautiful dish, and it will eat as good room temperature as it will eat warm or hot. So if you're planning a gathering for folks and you're looking to take some of the stress out of it, any of these three dishes work really well. Plus, you, know, you get to serve seafood to a crowd, which can be difficult, I, I admit, if you're trying to entertain and have a good time. So check it out. All right, so the last one I'll talk about is, is a dish that we've actually done here before, so you can go back and check out more of it on the um, the braised seafood uh, webinar that we've done, but it's the puttanesca, uh, which is basically a very highly flavored tomato sauce. And I use uh, a pasilla chili, arbol chilies, um, anything that has a lot of flavor, but not a huge amount of spice, so you don't want to blow people away, but you do want that underpinning of punctuation that chilies bring. Uh, Pasillas, arbol, ch chili arbol just happen to be what I have around the house. I've also got chipotle moreno, uh, moritas, um, another. Any of these would really work. A chipotle, a dry chipotle would be really good, or a chipotle in adobo if you can handle that heat. That smokiness added to this would be delicious. But what it is, is again, it's olive oil, uh, anchovies, garlic, those chili flakes, uh, all simmered down together. You want to sort of toast the chilies in the oil uh, to really bloom their flavor and, and sort of... Huh, sorry, get distracted because there is a hawk sitting on top of my chicken coop. Hmm. Well, all the girls are in, so we're good. You won't distract me too much. Let me tell you, life on a farm... It's interesting. It's very interesting. Okay, enough of that. So simmer all of this in the oil to sort of bloom those flavors and help carry it through a dish. And this is true of whatever you're doing. <clears throat> you know, for instance, paprika. If you add paprika to a cup of water, you know, put them in, take a drinking glass, put a cup of water in it and just add some paprika and stir it up and see what happens. Over the course of many hours, it will finally soften and rehydrate, and it will basically become particles in the water. But if you add it to oil, what happens is the oil very quickly takes on the color, the flavor, the aroma of it, because the flavor of capsicums, so peppers, is fat-soluble. Uh, so whatever you're doing, whether it's black peppercorns, whether it's paprika, whether it's chili flakes, adding it to oil is a great way to, A, mellow their flavors. I think you get more of the charming charisma out of the pepper when you introduce it through oil. Um, but you also get your full value out of it. So simmer that, and then I add uh, white wine, or you could do red wine, uh, cans of fire-roasted tomatoes I particularly like, or do the 28 count. 28 ounce cans of San Marzano tomatoes, which give you the really, really satisfying pleasure of crushing the tomato in your hand, which wash your hands first, but oh, it's so satisfying. It's so wonderful. Wear an apron too, wear an apron. Anyway, uh, all of this gets simmered together and then the sauce gets punctuated with capers, black or green olives, and then some torn or fresh basil leaves, uh, torn fresh basil leaves or dried basil leaves for this sort of garnish right at the very end. Um, so it's this incredibly richly flavored tomato sauce. Is it good on pasta? Yes, of course it's good on pasta. Is it good served over steamed brown rice? Uh, it's actually 
excellent. Yes, of course. It's perfect if you add in a couple of cups of you know uh, cooked quinoa or barley or amaranth, whatever it is, and sort of make this wonderful stew. You can use it as a vinaigrette almost on things like that for uh, salads with lentils. Uh, but the sauce really comes into its own, I think, when seafood is simmered into it in the same way. Add, just add frozen seafood, uh, fresh, whatever it is, something that has some structural integrity. So you wouldn't want to do sole um, or anything that is going to really flake apart like hake. Things like cod, things like Alaska pollock, things like monkfish that have that structural integrity are best for this because you really do want to simmer them, let them cook, let them absorb those flavors. Uh, and then unlike the other sort of veg forward dishes, which are really, I'm putting 80% of what's on the plate is vegetables. In this case, you're really just simmering this sauce that is the vegetable and then serve it over brown rice pilaf, serve it over whatever you want, roasted potatoes, roasted root vegetables. Uh, it becomes kind of a go-to thing. And the sauce itself, I make in big batches and have it in my freezer in you know, Ziploc baggies or whatever. And uh, just take it out, thaw it, thaw it in a, you know, a, a couple cups of, of hot water out of the sink, and uh, you're good to go. All right. With that, that's uh, the dishes that I wanted to present to you and talk about. Um, again, for those of you, any of you who are joining us a little late here, uh, we had originally scheduled our programming today to be with our dear friend Nadine Brown to be talking all things wine amongst great friends. Uh, she was not able to join us today, but we will be back in touch with you about when uh, she is going to join us. I know she was looking forward to it, so she sends her regrets, but we'll see you again soon. So let's uh, dive into some questions here again. Uh, throw in your questions on the right-hand side. Click the little heart button if there is a question that's particularly relevant to you you'd like to see me answer. And it uh, looks like we've got a good number of questions here in about uh, just a little over a half hour before my hard out of daycare uh, starts. I've got a little eight-month-old boy and a four-year-old boy at home with us full-time, uh, as well as my wife has a full-time job. So life is hectic. Life is loud. Life is wonderful. My boys are a brightness, and I cherish their light. So, But that will cut shorter time with you, so let's dive into it. All right, from Terry, thank you for offering this advice segment. Of course, veggies and seafood, a favorite combination in our house. Awesome. With uh, help with seasoning ideas is helpful. What seasonings and when to add them? All right, so uh, to me, the seasoning should really should focus on whatever the vegetable is that you're using. Uh, seafood... You kind of can't go wrong with most seasonings, uh, especially if there is some other supporting character uh, within the cast of your dish uh, that whatever that seasoning is, is particularly well married to. So if you're doing beans or succotash, marjoram, savory, uh, you know, dried herbs like dried rosemary or dried sage is going to go really nicely in there. When to add seasonings? Well, with dried herbs, add them at the beginning because the beauty of them needs to be coaxed out. Uh, they are obviously going to be more potent than their fresh counterparts in some ways. So if it calls for a cup of fresh parsley leaves, do not add a cup of dried parsley because you will... It's, it's not, it won't be good. You're talking about probably a tablespoon or maybe even less at that point. So dried herbs, hard herbs as well when they're fresh, like rosemary, like sage, like thyme, uh, they get added all at the beginning. And so they simmer their flavor, their flavors and in, in elegance gets coaxed into a dish. Um, things like paprika, things like onion powder, garlic powder, um, fennel seeds, another one of my very favorites. Uh, coriander, cumin, those all get added at the beginning of a dish, whether uh, you're uh, roasting something, etc. The only thing you want to be mindful of is that you don't want to burn the spice. So if you're going to be roasting large chunks of root vegetables, maybe, you know, that are going to take 45 minutes or so in a hot oven, don't put your spices on at the very outset. Put them on maybe 10 minutes to go so that they have time to cook and to flavor, but they're not going to be in there that whole time cooking and burning. Uh, other seasonings, I mentioned uh, fennel seeds, fennel seeds, 
uh, fennel liqueurs like Herb Sant or Pernod are some of my very favorites and go-tos. Uh, I use a lot of onion powder in my cooking. Why? Because it's tasty. It makes things taste good. Uh, and I don't think it's a cheat or a hack. It's it's really just good stuff. I don't rely on it the way like ranch dressing relies on it per se, but uh, a little bit added tomato sauce and an into roasted vegetables added into your simmer bases is exceptional. Uh, so I hope that helps. Uh, it's kind of a, a bit of a, a broad question, uh, but uh, so forgive a bit of a, a broad answer, but um, hard herbs and dried spices in at the beginning, fresh herbs uh, in at or near to the end because you want them to retain their freshness. So think of them really as a flavor garnish as well as a visual garnish. Tarragon is among my very favorites in terms of pairing with seafood and with vegetables. It has an elegance that is unmatched by just about any other flavor. Um, a little bit goes a long way and it's just truly marvelous when fresh. So it's one of the things that I grow within just 10 feet of my of my stove so that I can always grab some. So hope that helps. Hey, thank you so much for your question. I appreciate you joining today. All right, Winnie. Hi, friend. There are plenty of videos on how to clean shrimp from neck to tail. I enjoy prawn heads, but how should one clean the head of a prawn? Are there any particular parts that should be removed? Good question. All right, so with shrimp shells, prawn heads, uh, there's nothing that needs to be removed from them or cleaned. Uh, I eat the whole thing uh, when they are small, uh, so I've never, I, I, there's nothing that really needs to be removed. The only thing that I remove from a shrimp that I, it should not be eaten is the, the vein, uh, the digested tract that runs along the back of the shrimp or prawn meat itself. Uh, but in, in terms of just the shrimp head, uh, it's really quite simple that, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, this is a shrimp, right? This is your tail, tail end. This is your head. Uh, and if you go to peel a shrimp uh, with the head on, first thing you do is just grab it with thumb and forefinger right at the base where the head meets the tail section and simply rotate away. And just rotate it off. Or you could twist it off. Uh, you want to leave as much meat on the tail as possible, and there's two little segments that sort of run into the head, uh, and you can easily just remove those by doing that lever mechanism, by leveraging them off rather than ripping them apart this way. Uh, but after that, your heads are pretty much ready to eat. However, if you are looking to eat the head, I often just leave it right on the shrimp. Uh, depending on the size of the shrimp, you may or may not need to remove the tail shell. Um, you know, if you're grilling them or if they're relatively small shrimp, anything from, I'd say, 21, 25 size per pound up. Uh, I, I don't even bother peeling them a lot of times, especially if you're dry sauteing them, grilling them, broiling them, where that shell is going to get a little bit crispy and provide some textural contrast. Woo-wee! Tasty, tasty. Uh, but if you are removing a shrimp shell, uh, say for a pasta or for a curry dish, something where it is simmered in as part of other ingredients, I will say remove the entire shell. Don't leave that little tail piece on. It drives me absolutely nuts when chefs do that. Absolutely nuts. Like to go to a restaurant and fancy restaurant, and their pasta dish with shrimp and a tomato sauce and... You've got these shrimp shells with the you got these shrimp with the tails on. Like what do you want what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? You want me to stick my hands in there? I'm paying twenty six dollars for this entree. Like you source the shrimp right, you like from these great places and they're delicious wild shrimp delivered fresh and they're huge and beautiful and wonderful. And you took your time with this fresh tomato sauce and hand rolled your pasta and like and you left the shrimp tail on. Why? So I can dig in there with my hands or awkwardly try and use a knife on my pasta. It's like you just, it shows me that you're not thinking about the customer's point of view and how they're actually going to interact with the dish. Does it look good? Yes, it looks good, but it's not functional. So just take the whole thing off. Anyway, there's a little bit of meat. There's another segment of meat back in there that when given to the customer is going to be hard to get out, right? So you're actually just kind of wasting some of it. So just remove the whole shelf. All right, there you go, Winnie. Hope that helps.
Great question. From Susan, hi. Uh, veggie wash, fruit and vegetable wash is a product uh, sold to aid in safe removal of waxes, chemicals, and soils. Do you have any thoughts on the use of the product? Um, I do, and that is that I generally just, I, A, we're very fortunate. I live on a farm, uh, and I have the time and wherewithal to spend. Uh, we grow about 80% of our food uh, in season and probably about 50% of our food year-round. Uh, here. So a lot of the vegetables that I eat are coming right from here. And I know exactly what did not go on them, which is anything in terms of chemicals or waxes. Uh, this is one of the advantages of farmer's markets. This is one of the advantages of growing your own is that once you shorten that supply chain, those waxes are not necessary because those are there for moisture retention and preservation and duration of shelf life throughout the transportation and sales process, right? So I'm thinking about rutabagas, I'm thinking about turnips, thinking about apples, etc. cetera. Um, shorten the supply chain and you eradicate the need for any of that type of thing. So that would be my first thing. Second is uh, if you are able to access and to afford uh, the organic versions of uh, vegetables. Again, that reduces a significant section of the need for any fruit or vegetable wash because an well, organic system isn't adding to it the things that you really want to remove from it. So I understand that that is not always an option for multiple reasons. Uh, and so fruit and veg wash, you know, should you just be looking at sort of traditional American produce section, uh, what's available year round, yeah, I think they're uh, a, a fine idea. I know that most of them are simply just baking soda based, I think. Uh, just adding a slight, you know, raising the pH a little bit to, to create a, a basic solution that just helps to cut through uh, the waxes and whatever chemicals are on them uh, in a safe way. I believe that's what it is. I, I do remember, think, uh, I do remember, I believe I saw something that, doubted the effectiveness of, of those washes. But um, so I don't necessarily have uh, the clear science on it, uh, but I will say, hey, you know what? If uh, you feel like it's, it's adequate, you have the adequate time and ability to make that part of your cooking process and it makes you feel better about the products that you are eating or helps to improve texture by removing waxes, et cetera, uh, I say go for it. So, hey, I hope that helps. Cheers. Hilda, hi, friend. Nice to see you pop up again. I always love that you join us. I really, really appreciate it. A lovely Easter to you and family. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? Our chickens that are being threatened by the hawk still, um, but that are safe, uh, are starting to lay. And, uh, yeah, the girls are finally paying rent. Imagine that. And, uh, yeah, so we have Easter eggers, we call them. So we get... Uh, Couple shades of brown, tan, beautiful green eggs, beautiful blue eggs, robin egg blue, et cetera. So we don't even have to dye our eggs this Easter. That's wonderful. Anyway, okay. Uh, got off track there. Thinking of making a seafood wellington. Ah, cool. Uh, should I use a whole filet intact or a combination of seafood? Interesting. Wow. You know, I don't actually uh, have a very clear idea of what a Wellington is in my head. Uh, it's beef tenderloin, I believe, with like a mushroom duxel paste around it and then baked in a, a savory crust, I'm pretty sure, is a beef Wellington, uh, which is the model for this. So what I would recommend is uh, a single kind of seafood. Uh, don't Once you start mixing seafoods, which I'm a fan of in... Cachuoco, a um, bouillabaisse base uh, dishes like that, or a pot pie, where you can control the cooking times by adding them at different times. Uh, malt, mixing seafoods into this one unit that's got to be cooked for the same amount of time, regardless, I think gets you. It just introduces a lot more variables. Um, and while it might taste good and might look impressive, I, I think the, the risk of negative outcomes is a lot greater than necessarily the benefit of uh, flavor outcomes. So 
I would use a whole filet. Uh, I would use uh, something big like salmon, something like uh, halibut maybe. Uh, though I would also urge you towards richer types of fish. So something like a halibut, something like a cod doesn't have a lot of fat in it. Uh, high in protein, absolutely delicious, healthful, wonderful, but it is not going to give you as much leeway to overcooking uh, as would a salmon or uh, what I might suggest here is as a sable fish. Um, uh, I know that uh, you've probably spent some time up in BC uh, if you don't live there, uh, in fact, but um, you, you know that sable fish, the great uh, uber rich, delicious white flesh fish of the West Coast here uh, in North America is absolutely delicious. That's something that I would recommend. Use skin off filet regardless. Whatever you do, use a skin off filet because it's just going to steam inside of the pastry crust and steamed skin is not going to be good in this case. Um, and the other thing I would do is to recommend uh, butterflying the filet out uh, and then rolling it up. So here's your salmon filet. Okay, here's my arm. This is your salmon filet, right? So it's sitting on the cutting board. Here's your cutting board. So uh, tail end, head end. Cut it laterally, horizontal to the cutting board, about as even as you can make it. Um, and you're, you're going to come to about here before... You know, what you want is two even sections that are about even thickness. And once you get to about two thirds of the way down the filet here, you don't want to just let it be. Let the cut come out here so that you have a tail section and then you have this section, which you then fold over. And don't cut all the way through. If this is your filet, start here and cut till about here or so. So you still have the filet connected. Lay that out so that you now have a butterfly filet with the tail section and slather the whole thing with olive oil, with spices, with herbs, um, things that are gonna taste good steamed, so maybe not raw garlic, uh, <clears throat> but maybe some onion powder, maybe some garlic powder, maybe some toasted ground fennel seeds, a little bit of black pepper, certainly salt. Uh, you could add in certainly olive oil or just chunks of butter, etc. And then roll that filet back up, um, you could even cut off that tail section and sort of add that as a third layer and roll that up so you have a roulade sort of thing. But now you also have um, a roll, which is generally the same thickness throughout. That's the goal here. Um, and so now you get that sort of beef tenderloin construction uh, that allows for those thin slices down. So that's one way to do it. It's a little more complicated sort of technically, but it's not difficult. Um, it's a really fun way to do it. Plus you get to introduce uh, different flavors. And the other way to do it, of course, is just to use the whole filet and wrap it sort of top to bottom, place it on the pastry crust, slather it with whatever you want, and then lay dough over top of it. So you're making almost like a you know, sort of encasement. Um, the disadvantage of that is you're going to overcook your tail by the time your head fillet is cooked. Um, but it's going to be delicious. It's going to be moist. Uh, it's going to be tasty. Use just one kind of seafood. There you go. Thanks, Hilda. I really appreciate that you join us. Hey, from Randall. I just described the Russian Kalibiak. Yes, I did. Uh, is the seafood version of Wellington Cheers. Uh, Kalibiak, uh, I believe, also is uh, uh, one traditional preparation of it is made from sturgeon. Um a popular and sort of luxuriant seafood uh, often available in Russia, or traditionally in that cuisine, where the marrow of the sturgeon uh, backbone was also used as part of the butter or mixed into the, the mushroom duxelle, duxelle uh, as part of that. So, yeah, wow, I haven't thought about that dish since culinary school. So, hey, thanks, Randall. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, fun dish. All right, Chef Martin, recipes look yummy. Thank you, Nancy, I appreciate it. Uh, do you barbecue fish, in particular salmon? If so, any helpful advice how to do so, including seasonings? Thanks for everything you do. Oh, I appreciate that. You know, Nancy, I'm gonna ask you, uh, uh, well, actually, I, I get it. So when you say barbecue, I'm going to assume that you are in, inferring on the grill. Um, as opposed to the American South style of barbecue, which is long, slow, smoked. 
uh, over many hours. So we're going to go with the grilling uh, version of barbecuing. Uh, do I barbecue salmon? I, yes, I do. Absolutely. I barbecue a lot of fish. Uh, the first things to look for are skin on or fish with structural integrity. Part of the grill is that, well, you have this open grates, right? So the heat is coming up and you have this direct or indirect heat on it. Uh, you inherently are touching the fish uh, a little bit more than you do, say, when you roast it, which you put it on a pan, put it in the oven, and take it off the pan to put it on a plate, right? With grilling, you have to turn it, flip it, etc. There's just more to it. So you want a fish with structural integrity. Structural integrity either comes from the way the muscles are structured, so say salmon, uh, which has some structural integrity, swordfish, tuna, etc., that stick together like steak fish, uh, monkfish, or things that have the skin on them to add that structural integrity. If you are using fish with the skin on, you can think about it in two ways. Are you going to eat the skin or just use it to help you get the fish to the plate? If you are going to eat the skin, which I do recommend for most species, uh, you need to cook the skin side first, and you need to accomplish something, which is you have to make the texture of the skin desirable, which means you have to make it crisp, which means you have to use a higher level of heat than I would recommend for just a skinless filet. And here's why. Steamy, soggy, flaccid skin right? No, no, just no, no. It's gross, right? Crispy, beautiful, charred on the outside skin that has this pork crackling-like flavor and just this wonderful presence on the palate. Woo! Yeah, yes, yes, right? So approach the cooking process as though you are cooking the skin. The filet, the meat of the matter, will come as a result. When I cook skin on uh, and when I grill, I use live heat. So I am a charcoal wood grill uh, exclusively. However, you can do this method with gas grilling as well. And the method here is that you have high heat in one area and low heat in another. How do you do that? Shove all your wood or your coals to one side. Or if you're using gas grill, turn it on to high, turn it on to low. There you go. Now you've got two cooking zones. And the advantage to this is that well, I can crisp my skin over here on the high, high heat side and get all that flavor and texture that I want. And then I can move it over here over the low heat side and use the lid of the grill as a means to capture heat and create an ambient environment that's going to cook low and slow at a temperature that's going to give me a moist, succulent, delicious filet as well as that crisp skin. So there you go. One other trick or technique that you want to do when grilling any seafood is before you put it on the grill, think about how you're going to take it off the grill, right? As with all things cooking, imagine your final result before you start the process of cooking. Have an idea of where you want to go because then the process might actually get you there, right? Use your process to achieve a goal. Don't just dive into the process and hope for the best. So here's a grill, right? Here's your grill grates that run in whatever direction. Now, if you have a skin-on piece of salmon that's this size, right, uh, and you put it on the grill like this, what's going to happen? Well, now you have to go, in order to get under that salmon skin, you've got to go across all of those individual wire grates to get that salmon off, right? Or you could put the salmon on the grill grates like this, and what do you do? You go straight along the grill grates. You use the grates to help you remove the fish from it. So always think about your end process before you start your beginning of the process. How to get your skin not to stick? Use appropriate heat. It's not necessarily about the oil or the seasoning of the grill. The grill's gotta be clean. Uh, but the key here is that uh, the grill is hot when you put the fish on. It is the proteins that stick to the surface. And this is true of sauteing, this is true of roasting, this is true of grilling. If it's hot when you put them on, you cauterize, you, you, you coagulate those proteins quicker, and you cook 
the, the separation comes from cooking, not from necessarily oil or lubrication there. Lubrication certainly helps, yes. But what it helps to do, actually, is to cook those proteins. It helps transfer the heat, and so it cooks them quicker. That's what you are achieving is the cooking. So once those proteins are coagulated, they naturally separate because they're no longer sticky. So there you go. Um, and one last little tip for this, because this is a, a question I see, got a lot of hearts on it and a lot of interest. But um, if you are going to remove your fish, I don't do grill marks, right? Those beautiful cross hash marks where you get, you know why? Because if they have just one set of marks, it looks really good, right? And I didn't have to touch it. The less I touch the fish, the more chance I have of feeding the fish to my family rather than the fish to the fire. There you go. So it looks great. Don't touch it. And I cook the fish about 90% of the way up from the skin. Why? Because the skin is protecting it from moisture loss, uh, as well as you're getting that skin crispy. And then I just, if I flip it over at all, I just flip it over and let it sit for 10 minutes. I mean, I'm sorry, 10 seconds or so just to cook through. The less you touch, the better. All right. I'm giving long answers here and we got a bunch more questions. So thank you for that question. I appreciate it. All right, on to the next one. Marion, hi, friends. Cooking shows, I see strong opinions about seafood and cheese. Do you have a strong opinion about whether the two can go together? Uh, yeah, I do. Yes, I do have a very strong opinion about that. And my opinion on that is, let me tell you, you are right. Huh? Yeah, my opinion is that you are right. Do you enjoy Parmesan cheese on your clam pasta? Great. I shouldn't tell you not to. Do you like tuna melts bathed in cheddar cheese? Great. So do a lot of other people. Does any chef have any business telling you what you should and should not enjoy? No. Just no. I mean, yeah, th there's things that we can guide you towards, like don't poach kiwis and coriander scented bacon fat and call it cuisine. Like just, uh, uh, no, you know, I mean, go, go for it if you want to, but I recommend if you like it, it works. That's the bottom line. Uh, do I think that there are things that don't work for me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but cod basted with mayonnaise mixed with Parmesan cheese and lemon zest, it's absolutely delicious. One of my very favorite dishes in all of America is at Zuni Cafe in San Francisco, which is a plate of anchovies with thick shaved slices of Parmesan cheese and raw celery. It's unreal good. So bottom line is I think they pair together really well. I know other people think they don't, but it doesn't matter because it's your opinion that does matter. Cool. Great question. Thank you. Hey, Judith. Nice to see you. I'm preparing grab locks with all the components for Easter. Ooh, any wine recommendations? It's a difficult one. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say it's a difficult one. Dill can be, which is part of the seasoning mix for grab locks, uh, can be a little uh, difficult, but... It really doesn't have to be. Um, so wines that I would go with, a, a if you're doing something non-traditional, like a Gewürztraminer, which is a he super heavy, aromatic uh, German and Alsatian French varietal. You, there's also some really good ones coming out of Washington State, Oregon, uh, as well as some of the cooler climates in California. Uh, Gewürztraminer is wonderful. It's this super heady uh rich with sort of tropical fruits, uh, papayas or passion fruit, uh, but dry on the back palate, though it's weighty, it sits on the palate. Uh, a good Gewürztraminer is also going to have some good acidity that's going to cut through the fattiness of the salmon. So when you're doing a Gravlax, think of what you're doing. You're taking fatty, rich salmon and removing a bunch of water from it, which at which point it makes it even fattier, richer salmon, right? So you need something with acidity. Uh, and off-dry Riesling is also a really great uh, pairing with that. Uh, you want to look for a Cabinet or a Spatles uh, in the German uh, system that uh, sort of measures the amount of residual sugar. A really good one, if you can find it, is Leitz, L-E-I-T-Z, Leitz, Dragonstone, or any of the Leitz uh, coming out of the Mosul region in Germany are fabulous wines. Uh, there's also a really fun one. Um, Chateau, Chateau Saint-Michel makes a good one. Uh, Horse Heaven Hills, I believe. Um, 
So there's some really good Rieslings out there. Uh, and then also rosés. So a rosé of Grenache is going to be really nice. You want to look something uh, good acidity, but also high fruit content that's going to match the citrusy in the salmon. Also bring out some of the aroma of the fish itself. So a number of options there. You know what? Do all three. Have yourself a really fun Easter. There you go. All right. Hey, Sharon. Nice to see you again. Sharon, I'm grateful for your amazing seafood literacy course. Thank you. Making roasted salmon dusted with mace. What's a great potato dish to go with it? Mm. All right. Uh, a great potato dish is salmon and mace. So those of you who know my work, I, I love me some mace. It is what I consider the seafood spice uh, added at the beginning of a cooking process. Uh, it is the lacy outer hull of nutmeg. It is basically savory nutmeg. Uh, it's delicious. A uh, good salmon uh, potato dish to go with that. Uh, dice your potatoes, a white potato or a red skin potato, something that's going to hold some uh, texture to it. Uh, boil them for about two to three minutes uh, just till you soften them and sort of make it a moist heat cook method. Then a bunch of olive oil uh, in a cast iron pan and some slivered almonds and garlic, this thin sliced garlic. Throw all that in the crusty toaster oven or oven and just roast it until they are barely crisp. The almonds are toasted. Uh, that almond garlic mace uh, counterpoints are fantastic. So the only key to that is don't burn your almonds. Um, so you want to get the potatoes to the point where they're cooked enough that the cooking process is only going to be about 15 minutes or so in the oven. Um, yeah, so there you go. Cheers. Anyway, and also a little bit of burn on the almonds is is going to taste good. You just don't want them black. Cool. All right, Sharon, thank you. Hey, Donna, can you recommend some reasonably priced wines that are vegan? Uh, awesome. I, I can't off the top of my head. No. Uh, to those of you who say, what? Vegan wines? Huh? Uh, wines are clarified oftentimes with uh, gelatin. Or isinglass. Isinglass is a product that is made from the swim bladders of fish, typically out of the cod family. So uh, are there vegan wines? Yes, there are. A huge amount of wines are made with, uh, are clarified or fined, it's called, uh, with bentonite, which is a type of clay uh, that attracts particulates to it and doesn't add flavor to the wine. So off the top of my head, I don't know which wines uh, are which there, um, but I do know that you are not seeking out a tiny little niche of vegan wines, that bentonite and vegan fining methodologies are part of mainstream winemaking. Uh, how to find that information, you need to go to individual winery websites, um, but... There you go. I hope that helps. Sorry, I don't have uh, specific examples for you. Cool. All right. Enjoy grilled salmon and have it at least two to three times a week. Well, Darlene, don't you live well? Good for you. Right on. Grilled, too. You must live somewhere where you can find your grill. Like up here in Maine, the grill just disappears in the snow for a couple of months every year. It's like an expedition to go out and find it. And we do. But anyway, good for you. Grilled salmon two, three times a week. Um, any wines to, to go with it? Uh, I really like Gamay. Gamay is the grape. That it is a red grape that is behind Beaujolais wines. Uh, and if you had bad memories uh, or a bad uh, impression of Beaujolais Nouveau, A, I would ask you to reconsider it because there's some really delicious, compelling, interesting wines out there that only last for a couple of months before they go bad. That's their point, is they're supposed to be drunk fresh. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. Gamay as a grape, when it's grown with an eye towards lasting wines, meaning you know a traditionally sort of uh, vinified and then aged wine, uh, can be absolutely incredible, full of these really wonderful, ripe, uh, sweet, sour cherries, uh, bright fruit. You can even sense like apple out of it. Um, it, it drinks like a acidic white uh, in some ways, like a heavy body Sauvignon Blanc in terms of the weight on the palate, but it brings so much charisma and elegance. Uh, good ones to look for are the uh, Beaujolais Village, 
uh, villages, in, if you just read the French word uh, in an English accent. So uh, there are, I think, 13 different villages in which uh, the Gamay grape is grown uh, and wines are made. And they're absolutely delicious. There's going to be some difference to them. Uh, like Morgon, M-O-R-G-O-N, is one little town or appellation that I particularly like, saint Julianas, J-U-L-E-N-A-S, Julianas, uh, is also a really wonderful that makes these very ebullient uh, fruit-forward wines tend to be. Uh, they're not overly oaked. They're meant to be drunk fresh, even slightly chilled at cellar temperature, like 55 degrees. Really, really tasty wines. Uh, and to pick up the smoke, uh, on salmon, grilled salmon really well. So there's a good one for you. Um, Gamay grape, uh, it doesn't have to come from France. There's also some great wines coming out of, uh, Washington as well as California. They're doing a nice job. Uh, another red would be lighter Cabernet Francs. Uh, and for a white, um, try a, uh, Pinot Gris, not Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris. G-R-I-S. Pinot Gris is a heady, aromatic white, uh, just blooms with flavors, pairs beautifully with salmon in any preparation. So Pinot Gris, uh, grown all over the place. Oregon in particular has some really good ones out there, and they're all reasonably priced. All of those wines I just mentioned are. So awesome. Thank you, Darlene. I appreciate it. You live well again. All right. Do you have gluten-free recipes? Hi, Janice. Uh, I do, actually. All of the recipes that I shared with you today are gluten-free. Uh, I use very little in my cuisine, uh, sources of gluten. Um, so urge you towards those. Uh, but I don't have any cuisine that's particularly sort of uh, named such or directed in such a way. But uh, there are lots of resources on Ruby. Uh, throughout the courses for gluten-free diets, as well as I know our friends at Forks Over Knives do an incredible job uh, with that as well. So please check out Forks Over Knives. Awesome. Hey, Janice. I appreciate you. Appreciate you joining. All right. From Riley, uh, what type of oil do you use when cooking seafood? Does it depend on the type of fish? So with me, uh, when I use oil, I almost always use it as an ingredient, not as a facilitator. Uh, and the, the difference there is when I saute my zucchini, I use olive oil because I really like the flavor of olive oil. Uh, and I am actually going to include it in the dish. I'm going to scrape the pan and use that as part of the sauce, let it emulsify with those juices that come out. Right. So in that way, I use extra virgin olive oil. I like the flavor. I use a nice soft, uh, lean one with a good acidity without the bite on the back. Uh, sort of the bright green fruit. Um, the Cento brand is the one I use because I can buy it for $20 for a you know, big gallon size container of it. Um, I pretty much use extra virgin for everything. Uh, I do have a vegetable oil that I use and I use that for making aiolis, etc. If I am doing like a hard sear on something, I will use that instead. But if I'm just putting something on the grill, you know what? I'll use olive oil there too. I like the flavor. It's what I've got. Um, I don't use enough oil in things that the difference in price is prohibitive. And if you're adding a half tablespoon of oil to something you're going to throw on the grill, the difference in price there, yes, it does add up. And I'm not insensitive to that. But overall, you know, I use the olive oil and I just use the crap and then I use it so frequently that I go through it. It's always fresh. It's always delicious. Uh, and that's why I focus on that. When I'm sauteing seafood like uh, flounder or something with a lot of surface area, I use a very flavorful fat. So I would use butter there uh, because I want it to take on that flavor because you're cooking it for so little time that you want to get your flavor garnishes in with the other ingredients in the pan, that there being the butter. If I'm sauteing scallops, same thing. I will use vegetable oil, but also a little bit of butter to add that flavor in. If I'm sauteing salmon, you know what? I don't do it over maximum high heat. I do it over medium, medium high heat, and I do it with olive oil. Because again, I'm going to tip that pan and then scrape it out 
and use that oil as part of the sauce. So that's me. Those are my preferences. Uh, not necessarily technically correct, but there's also not any technically wrong answer to that question. So hope that helps. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you, brother. Do you ever reuse cooking oil? A few classes I've taken recommend that we strain and save in the fridge. Your thoughts from Wendy. Um, hmm. Do I ever reuse? Yes. Uh, you know, if I'm deep frying something, uh, using so much oil that it's actually worth saving, uh, yes. But only if I was deep frying something like a vegetable frito misto, um, where it's a batter and the vegetables are not adding a deep rich flavor. Say if you are deep frying shrimp or scallops or pieces of cod, your oil is going to taste very much like those things. If you're deep frying pieces of cauliflower and green beans and fronds of fennel and slices of lemon, yes, your oil is going to taste like those things, but yeah, okay, well, that is a pretty good combination of things for just about anything else you would cook in it with. Um, so that I would save. Also, because I'm not dipping anything with flour into it, uh, the flour is bound up in the batter, uh, and so you end up with a clearer oil. If you're just dipping in, you know, dredging and flour and then frying, that oil gets so murky so quickly uh, that I haven't found that it's really worth saving. Uh, in restaurants, yes, you can get two days out of a deep fat fryer um, at home. I've never really found it worth it. And, and quite honestly, I deep fat fry so little at home that I wouldn't use it again quickly enough to, to warrant saving it. Uh, if you're sauteing, if you're roasting or broiling or doing any of those things, you shouldn't have enough oil in the process that you would need or think to save it is the other part of that question. So, all right, Wendy, I hope that helps. All right, folks, I've got about five more minutes here and a couple more questions. So thanks so much for your time today. Greetings from Sylvia. Uh, pleased to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, you no know, other spices I can add in fish apart from fish spice and salt when marinating. Sure. Garlic powder, onion powder, mace, fennel seed, coriander, ground uh, toasted coriander seed, cumin. Uh, I'm just looking at what I've got over there. Those are the big ones that I use. Not all of those need to be together. Any of those on its own is going to add deliciousness. Uh, many of those are one component of a fish spice, uh, depending on which one you're using. Uh, used smartly together, many of those do pair beautifully, um, but you just don't need all of them. It's kind of overkill. There's just too many flavors. Um, so all of those go very well with, uh, with seafood. Again, as I said earlier about toasting spices and sort of being mindful not to overcook them, um, always add dry spices at the beginning of a process, but just be mindful that if you're then going to go take it out on the grill and kill it over super high heat, maybe you back off on the spices and add them just before you're done in the last couple minutes of cooking time. So there you go. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, it's from Shane. Hi, Chef. When portioning a side of salmon, you recommend cutting it on the bias or cutting it straight down? Great question. Uh, and a couple of different thoughts on that. Uh, a, what's your intended result and what's your cooking method? If you're going to be cooking it on the grill, cutting it on a bias is going to be tough because you're increasing the surface area and you're decreasing the structural integrity. So be mindful of that. If you're cutting it on the, cooking it on the grill, you want straight up and down cuts. So it's easy to manage, to handle with tongs or spatula, et cetera, and you have an even thickness throughout rather than tapered edges, right? Are you sauteing? Cool. Yeah, slicing on a bias is great because you actually get more surface area, so you get more crisp or more opportunity to create uh, textural contrast, which can be a very good thing. Don't go overboard on it. It doesn't need to be super dark, deep brown, caramelized, crusty. Just enough to add a hint of textural contrast and flavor contrast is enough. Um, poaching, 
Same thing. I you think that uh, slicing on a bias is great because you expand the surface area that is exposed to the flavorful poaching broth, right? So you get more poach for your poaching kind of way of thinking about it. But you do get less structural integrity. So always think about it that way. The other advantage, though, that I will say in a completely different way of thinking about slicing on a bias is that slicing on a bias gives you more plate coverage. It takes four ounces of salmon and, make, and turns it from two fingers wide into three fingers wide, or maybe even four, depending on where on the fillet you are, right? Same portion size, more plate coverage, more perception of value, more perception of satiation, you know, First impressions matter, and when you put down a plate in front of somebody, you know, these very thin little four-ounce, five-ounce portion of salmon is more than adequate. It's all that we need, but it might not look impressive. But that, oh, that looks impressive, and first impression is of generosity. That can be a very positive thing. So a couple ways to think about it. Hey, thanks for your question. Really great question. I appreciate you joining. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. All right, another one from Wendy. Favorite uh, salmon dish uh and i can't quite read it maple oh maple syrup and bacon oh hell yeah ah not on the healthiest but yummiest for sure well absolutely you know what uh so i've been boiling down my maple syrup maple sap over a wood fire uh over the past uh, couple of weeks and you, do you know what i smell like i smell like maple syrup and bacon i just smell smoky sexy seductive woodsy like i feel like i smell like maine like, uh, this is the very best of a flannel shirt. It's awesome. Very proud of myself. Anyway, yes, bacon and maple syrup and salmon is a delicious combination. Cool. Thanks for sharing, Wendy. Appreciate you. All right, another one. I thoroughly enjoyed the seafood literacy course and learned more than ever possible about seafood. I'd recommend it to all, some home and pro cooks. Well, thank you for that recommendation. That is a wonderful way to go out. So thank you all for joining me here today. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, we'll be back in touch about upcoming and forthcoming events. As always, send me an email to barton at ruby.com if you have any further questions. Follow me on Instagram. Check out any of my books, available booksellers everywhere. And uh, hey, I appreciate you. Cooking is an act of love. And uh, the world needs more of that. So thanks for the love that you are pouring into the world. Take care. Bon appetit.